welcome to the old town hall. Um, Keith is going to be our moderator, and we're going to introduce, um, he's going to do the introductions of the women who agreed to do this event. And full disclosure, there are a few that grew up close to Brookfield, but not technically in Brookfield. Um, the other thing I want to add is that kind of um, this, we're kind of closing out the month as we approach Labor Day weekend. At the beginning of this month, there was an event that kind of was about people talking about why they moved to Brookfield. And I would say this is the flip side. And these are people that grew up and, you know, know the history of what it was like when they were younger. So. All right, again, thank you for coming. So those of you who don't know me, I'm Keith Sprague, um, son of John and Linda Sprague. And Linda's here tonight, as you'll get an introduction from her. Um, and I also moderated last year um, the, the men's version of this, I suspect it is. Um, so and that, was, that was great fun, uh, which hopefully, uh, I'm sure, and, uh, this will be that also. Um, and remembering back of that, the, the men's version of this, and, and I, re I just remember, um, well, first off, they were very difficult to manage, but they. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll see how this goes here. But, uh, but I, I remember, like, just a takeaway as I left there that night and went home and thought about it days after how. Simple it was uh, back in that time frame um, or that generation to find happiness in your day to day life and uh, or day to day entertainment or whatever it was and I just just uh, took that home uh, with me and um, just continue that in my thought process of of this modern world is just so complicated and we're just you know, constantly running into people not happy or we're not happy or this or that, but my God, it just seems so simple and the simplest things were just so entertaining and they still can be to this day. So hopefully, you know, we'll see that light again here, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're gonna try to end this thing at 8.30 uh, is what my marching orders here are. Um, and, and with that, this event is going to be pretty dull and boring without participation from all of you guys. So, uh, like, I, I, I don't. <laughs> uh, so, 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 as, so as, as far as me being the one driving questions, and I'm going to be lame. That's what I mean by that. So. Um, I, I think that a lot of questions needs, need to come from you guys. We're going to start with introductions um, of each, and then we're going to open it up to, to questions. Um, so there are two people, I know my mother, for instance, and I'm not sure who the other person is, but well, that didn't grow up here in Brookfield. But I would encourage you to talk about, you know, your upbringing some, because I know on my mother's side, for instance, and I'm sure, all, you know, they're just tremendous stories. Uh, very, very uh, uh, similar to the ones that did grow up in Brookfield. So with that being said, I don't know if this is you guys' microphone. Somehow, actually, 
and Brookfield was very good and set us up with our own little school. There, where one year there were nine kids and one year there were 11 in all eight grades. And five of us were always. <laughs> so, it, was, it was really quite fun and we could walk to school at that point. And I understand now that the schoolhouse has just been taken down. So it was quite sad to hear that. But otherwise, I went to, started out in East Randolph, then went to South Branch, which is by the Wheatleys, and then went to North Branch for the other years. Um, and then of my eighth grade class, there were, is this too long? No, you great. Okay. Of my eighth grade class, there were, I think there were eight of us. <coughs> and Steve, isn't it right that three of you went to Spalding? Yes. to high school, and two went to, or three went to Williamstown, yes. right. and two of us went to Randolph, because at that point there were no buses to any of the schools, so we all had to find our own transportation. In my family's case, we stayed with family or other people in Randolph until I was a junior, and then they decided to have a bus, and so then Brookfield joined Randolph as a union, and so we all could go to Randolph on buses. So that was a big change. So by the time Betty came along, she was bust. That's it, I was bust. Okay, I'm the little sister. Um, I went to school in South Branch for four years and then North Branch for four years. Uh, there were eight, four people in my class until we got to seventh grade and then they brought down four people from Han Village. So they were eight of us. But, but as Mary said, by the time, we didn't join the union no. until I was <coughs> maybe a sophomore in high school. So the, the kids in my class could choose where they went to high school as well. And some went to Randolph and many went to Spall. Mm -hmm. And I, that's all I'm going to say. My name is Melanie Laurel, and I grew up on West Street on a dairy farm. I had four older brothers and sisters, two sisters and two brothers. I was the baby. I went to school on West Street. I had to walk to school every day, rain or shine, snow, sleet, everything. Eight years. And our eight year graduation was held right here. The same as these ladies did too. because I was a teacher for very many years. <laughs> and I'm going to stand in line to the chair. And Kate says, you know, keep it short, but I spent this afternoon really thinking about what I wanted to say. And so I have only 13 pages of notes, so it probably isn't going to be really short. But please, please don't bring the hook out. You'll, you'll, you'll have plenty of chances. Oh, okay. So I'm Pat Mercier. I taught at the Brookfield School for many years. I'm retired now. But when I was young, I was Pat Lavender. And I live in the same house that I grew up in. And when, uh, that I grew up in. And the house and the land where I live has been home for almost 100 years for my family. So I thought I would talk about going back 100 years ago to how it became part of my family, or part of the home for my family. In 1920, my grandmother and my mother left Schenectady, New York, a city. They, uh, they left with my grandmother's second husband, George Hewitt, and their two children, Catherine and Henry. George was a carpenter, and he had three grown children from a previous, from a previous marriage, and his wife had died, and they were all grown and gone away. And then George had an accident that prevented him from being a carpenter. So his son, Joe Hewitt, who had recently come to Brookfield, he had bought a farm, and he decided that he would invite 
these city people to come and live with him. His father and his stepmother and their three children. So off they came. And they hired a trucker from Schenectady to bring them to Brookfield. Apparently, the trucker did not enjoy the, rot, the, the dirt road from Rutland <laughs> to Brookfield. Apparently, it was quite awful coming over Killington Mountain. And when they got to Randolph, the driver deposited the people and their possessions at the hotel in Randolph. <laughs> He was not going any farther. So they had to find a horse and wagon to bring them to Brookfield. And when they arrived, of course, there was this farmhouse that had been lived in for 40 years by a family before then. But there was no electricity. There was water into that kitchen sink through a lead pipe from the well or the spring that was up behind the house. There was an outhouse surrounded by those lovely golden gold flowers that my mother always called outhouse daisies. <laughs> uh, there were wood stoves for cooking and heating. There was a team of horses for work and occasional trips to town. And chickens. <coughs> and a couple of cows. My grandmother was a city girl who had worked for a very prominent family in Schenectady, New York, as a house servant. I can just imagine her reaction. And of course, she was a feisty Italian lass, uh, uh, Irish lass. <laughs> So my mother did have stories. My mother was probably about nine when she arrived. And she had a few stories to tell about life then. She did go to the Gaylord School, which was a school that was in Tribune neighborhood, still there, lived in by Kevin Ring. Uh, she told the stories about going to school and walking there and walking back. And also the time that somebody decided to scare her in the middle of the afternoon by hiding behind the stone wall at the orchard and pretending to be a bear. <laughs> and she didn't know whether she was going to go back to school ever again, but she did. Uh, she talked about the oranges that came from Texas at Christmas time because one of the older sisters, the grown children of her stepfather, lived in Texas, and she was called Sister Lucy, and her husband was Brother Parker. And they had quite a lot of money, but she loved the oranges because they didn't have fruit except for what grew already. She also has tales of her sister Catherine being sent to Minneapolis, Minnesota when she was in about seven, probably, to live with Sister Orr and her husband, Brother Frank. They were also the oldest sisters. And my mother always said that maybe they were childless, but probably she was sent because she was a feisty child also. My mother loved a little Morgan filly that belonged to the neighbors and spoke often about the joys of driving to town with a lovely little Morgan filly driving a sled. Uh, my mother moved back to Albany, New York, when she was 16 to live with Aunt Minnie Golden, my grandmother's sister. She attended secretarial school, worked, married a city boy, and made occasional trips to Vermont in a Model T. Then World War II began, and my father enlisted in the Navy. And it was at that time that it was decided that my mother and my infant brother returned to Vermont to be with her mother and uncle. At the end of the war, my father was convinced that he had city ways were over and he should be a farmer. He must have really loved her, but maybe he developed a love of the place. 
place, not the difficulty of farming at that time. In 1946, when they did move here, or shortly thereafter, a transition was taking place with agriculture. There was a market opening up for whole milk, for not just butter, as it had been in the past. There was, a, there was a need for more cows for more milk, and then there was a need for cooling them, and then having a trucker come to haul it to the creamery, and testing for buttermilk, and there was a lot of feed for all these extra cows and milking machines and barns. All of this was a rapid change because electricity came and the Rural Electrical Authority, that's the REA, in 1947. So before then, there was no electricity. So when electricity came, then of course there was an opportunity to have coolers. There was a refrigerator in the house. There was electric lights and not those kerosene lamps, lanterns that people had to use. Um, our 73 acre farm was no longer able to support the potato crops that my uncle had grown for money. He was very proud to be a 100 bushel seed potato grower. 100, that's 100 bushels per acre that he would grow. But they couldn't do that anymore because they needed the land for pasture and for the, for the hay to feed the cattle. There's more and more cattle. And also, horsepower was not adequate. You had to have the horsepower that was produced by machines, like a tractor. So there was, and machines cost money, and there was not enough for farming, and so farmers and their wives worked away. My mother's strawberry business and her egg business was not enough. How am I doing? Okay. Yeah, perfect. All right. <laughs> so when I was six, which was probably early 50s, um, <coughs> I have some memories because I, I was there and I was a little kid living in this changing world. And so I have some that I would like to share with you and I thought about these today. One of them was ice cream because I had recently just finished a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> but we only had ice cream in the winter time. And we only had it in the winter time because there were icicles on the roof. And we could use those icicles for the ice. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had the cream from the cattle. We had the eggs from the chickens. We could get sugar and vanilla from the store. And so we had a hand, hand cranker, and we spent a lot of time cranking ice cream in the winters. And it was luckily that I had a birthday in January, one brother had a birthday in February, and one brother had a birthday in March. So we all had lovely birthday parties with ice cream, and my mother would make angel food cake from scratch. So you, can, you do that because you have lots of eggs. In the springtime, um, I would go down to the neighbors, to John Gray's sugar house, and we would sit with him while he did his sugaring. We would go out with him into the woods with the horses and the sled that had the, brought the sap in, and we would go into the sugar house and sit on a couch. He had a couch because he spent all his time there. He slept there at that time, and he was always there for the, for the two or three weeks of sugar, and he was there doing sugaring. And his wife would always have lovely donuts for us to eat. And, and when you're six, that's pretty nice. In the summertime, my brother and I would we pretend to be cowboys, and we would gallop on our two ten horses through the pastures to the next door neighbors to play with the kids. And this was at the Blodgetts, and Mrs. Blodgett always had freshly baked rolls, and she would. 
would share them with us. So we went quite often. <laughs> now when I was six or seven, my playground was the brook, the pine grove, and the pasture where I was witness to the birth of calves. It was a, just a very lovely, quiet time. We would also have visits from the city people, the family that still lived in the city. They would come and we would have picnics by the brook where children and watermelons were cooled. <laughs> On one of my visits, my Aunt Catherine brought a boyfriend. Never occurred to me to wonder where her husband was. <laughs> they liked to drink Valentine beer. <laughs> and it was, the, it was in the cooler where they kept this Valentine beer in their hands to be cool. So this poor boyfriend was sent to the cooler to get the beer. He got the beer. His arm was filled with cans of beer. He put his hand down to get over the electric fence. <laughs> and he got the shock of his life. The beer was flying. The people who were watching laughed. He was kind of angry. And uh, I did notice that they were soon off to the East Branch of the store to get replacement beer because you couldn't drink that that night because it was just fizzled. But I don't think I ever saw him again at the farm. <laughs> And then fall came around and it was time for school and I went to school at the Brookfield Center School. Steve Hill was my only other first grade classmate. I walked one and a half miles to the, to the school. But there were some advantages to all of that because Mr. Milner, the farmer who lived across the street from the school, raised turnips for his cows. And so on the way home, and walk home, my brother and I would pick up turnips, and we would have a feast at home of turnips and whatever else my mother made. And we would also stop at the old Churchill Orchard, which is where the McManamies lived. And that was an abandoned house at the time. Nobody lived there, but they had a Wolf River tree that I would take home pets and bushels of apples in the fall, and we would have lots of pies all winter long. And one more thing that I remember about when I was that age was it must have been 1952, maybe General Eisenhower had been elected president of the United States, and my father had this quite large picture of him hanging over his desk. I did not really understand that, but I suppose because he was a veteran of the war that it was very important for them to, to do that. And but for the grace of God, I'm still here, 60 some years later. The land of the farm has been divided. Where my house was the only one on my road, there are now 13. Dairy farms are gone. Open land struggles to remain open. We get in our cars to work so we can pay the taxes and support our home and families. With global warming and unsure economy, worldwide political unrest, violence, and a lack of humanity, <clears throat> there is need for change. I wonder what my six-year-old granddaughter might say some 60 years from now. So thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Sprague. Um, I wasn't brought up in Brookfield. I was born in Orange, um, a town about 20 minutes away from here, on the other side of the mountain. I'm one of eight children. My parents uh, were born and brought up in Canada, 
and uh, met, married, bought a farm, and had eight of us children. I was in the middle, number four. Um, he never milked cows because he said he couldn't. He, he just didn't have the man for it. So then he went to um, raising beef cattle and uh, cropping the land, sold his hay, and uh, sold some wood, and uh, worked in the quarries. Um, all, all eight of us children went to um, a private Catholic school in Grantville. We would uh, get up at six o'clock in the morning and um, be ready to leave at 6.30, and we had breakfast in that time got in the car and dad dropped us off at school in Graniteville and then at seven o'clock he went to work. Well school didn't start until nine so um, sometimes the good nuns would let us in on a frigid cold day and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, so we entertained ourselves for uh, two hours. Um, one of the excuses uh, where we could get in at uh, eight thirty was if we decided we wanted to go to mass, and we became very good mass goers <laughs> in the winter times. Uh, from there, um, that was all eight years. We went to school there, then I went to Spalding High School. After that, I uh, went into nurses training. Um, I became a nurse, and um, shortly after that, I met my husband John. And as he will tell you, that's and moved to Brookfield. And as he will tell you, that's when I really started to be brought up <laughs> because he came right to the farm. He owned the farm, had bought it from his was in the, had bought it from his parents. We milked about forty uh, cows. We were in the process of changing from all Jerseys to Holsteins. This was bucket milking. Um, I never learned how to milk, but I did do everything else. Fed calves, um, scraped cows down, and all of that good stuff. We started having children, and um, it wasn't long before those children, Keith, Carrie, and Abby, were part of our uh, lifestyle. Um, and they remained active on the farm. They, as young children, they each had one job that they had to do. And they did not have to go to the barn before school, but they did have to come with me after school. Um, and it wasn't a big job. I can't remember what Keith had to do. I think he had to scrape the cows down. Um, I, when, I, was, I did cat chores. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did cat chores. <laughs> no, I did cat chores. Oh. <laughs> I think one of my first memories of when I came to the farm is John, I don't know if he was trying to impress me, but he took me right down to the barn to show me this one cow that he had just bought and paid $900 for. I was very impressed. Needless to say, that cow always was kept clean, had an extra shovel full of sawdust put underneath it all the time, and was never, wasn't allowed to get sick. Uh, that how we mentioned we did have to sell it. But it was a pretty big sum of money back in 1969 to pay for the cow, I think. So I like the non. Um, our kids were born, we had three within three years. Uh, I decided about when the oldest one got in high school that I really, they were all going to be in college at the same time and we needed some extra income. So that is when I went back to nursing. And um, it was a good life, it was a busy life. We, we were milking three times a day um, then. I did not get up for the middle of the night milking, but I did get up at like 4.30 or 5 and go down and help out then, and then come up, shower, and go to work. And um, it, was, it was a good, a very good life. We enjoyed it. and. Um, now our son does it, and his wife, and their two daughters. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Teresa Brown Taplin. I live up on West Street. Looks like I'm the youngster of the group up here. <laughs> um, I've lived here all my life. My grand 
parents, my great grandfather, came there in 1914. That's where the farm was in the Brown family. Um, he came from Chelsea in a horse and sleigh with my grandfather, his older brother, and his baby sister that was about four years old. And they came on horse and sleigh from Chelsea when the, their house burned out, out in Chelsea and they had to find a place to live. So my great grandfather uh, looked around and found this place. But he, in order to get here, they, the horse and sleigh was too, the snow was too deep. And they had to roll the road and it took them two days to get here. With, with three little kids on the sleigh and all their belongings that they had and hardly any food. And I live up on the end of West Street and there was only two houses there. Um, that, that farm was established in 1781 when this town was chartered. And um, so the neighbor that where John Cole lives right now, and I can't remember the name, but he saw them come in and that neighbor came up with a load of wood and some goods food for food for the family because he knew they didn't have anything and uh, helped them out. Otherwise, he said they, they would have froze to death the first few days there. Um, and my grandfather came there at um, barely eight years old and he wanted to farm. So my great grandfather bought the farm because he wanted to farm. His older brother was about uh, six years older than my grandfather, and he didn't really care about farming as much as my grandfather. Um, so he talked to my great grandfather into farming and bringing on cows, and eventually they had a pretty good milk and herd of Guernseys. Back then, six or eight cows was about all they milked. Um, so. And then my grandfather wanted to do some other things and, and diversify out a little bit. And he, he um, to help his father pay for the farm, they grew potatoes. And I don't mean an acre or two, it's 15, 20 acres. It took him over two weeks to harvest those potatoes every year. And all those potatoes, he got um, a contract to supply Norwich University. And of course, Norwich University is from, from, you know, the year is from September through May. So they had the potatoes to supply them. And my father said it was, it was a paycheck my grandfather got every, every week. He could count on that money coming in. That's why he did it. Um, and that helped pay for the farm, paid the mortgage for that farm. And my, my grandfather was, was quite the worker. Um, at eight years old, he bought his own little um, one long engine and went around, helped the neighbors saw wood. Um, and he paid for that engine that first year he, he had it. And that was, he borrowed the money from his father, $500. And he paid that off, working around to the neighborhood and helped cut the wood. Now he was he was a stout man. He was sh sh not really tall. I don't think his legs were more than two two feet long, but he, he got around and um, and then eventually um, the rest of the generation came along. Um, we pretty much was like the Waltons living together with my grandfather and grandmother in the house. Except there was only four of us instead of seven kids. <laughs> um, and then my younger brother came along years later. But um, we all had chores to do. We, we, as soon as we were big enough to carry a bucket and feed a calf or hold the bottle to feed a calf, we were in the barn working. I don't think I even knew how to wash a dish till I was up in my teens <laughs> because I was in the barn all the time. <laughs> Um, and then when haying season was around, uh, we would we did a lot of haying on a lot of lease property. We'd hay all over the West Street here. So I told my dad, I said I was getting old enough. I said at night we we'd have supper and we'd have to go back out haying. I said, Dad, I'll go milk the cows. You go finish haying. You can the boys can do it. 
And I, at 15 years old, I went in and I, I milked the cows by myself. My grandmother was a little worried about me because she says, what if something should happen to her and me with a cow? So she'd come down, walk them down to the barn, check me out, make sure everything was okay. I was in there milking the cows and singing along to the radio and she's wondering what the hand was going on. <laughs> but um, it was a good life. It was, you know, a lot of work. We, we enjoyed it. Um, I went to school over here in Brookfield. Uh, it, the school was fairly new at that time. Uh, we had two classes in one, in one school room. Most of the time, those the kids was around about 30, 35 class, kids in one room with like first and second grade was together, and third and fourth was together, and then fifth and sixth was together. And Mrs. Maloney kind of was my first teacher, and she will always be there in my memory because she's quite the lady. I remember her sitting there having lunch and drinking her buttermilk. <laughs> And then her husband at, at the beginning, when that school opened, was, was the janitor. And he would, uh, if you see any kids going down the hallway he's, and their shoe was untied, he'd say, hey, tie up your shoe. And he'd, st he'd stand right there until your two shoe was tied before he'd leave you. He didn't want you tripping and falling. Um, so, and then we went on to Randolph High School because that was where we went from here. We didn't have a choice back then where to go. And I graduated there and I helped my dad milk and sugar and all kinds of things. I went out working and then came home and helped him milk cows and so I was, I was around there sometimes. My, the rest of the siblings would be gone out of the barn and I'd stay there and help my father finish up milking. So he wasn't in the barn alone. So, so you know, we, we worked hard as soon as we were able to, but it was a good life and it's, it, it gets embedded in here. And, and once it's in there, you just don't know a different life. And, and, and I love cows. They're like, they're like my pet cat and dog to me, so, and I, it's where I started and that's where I live right now, and, and I guess I wouldn't change anything. <laughs> Thank you. Grandpa and 
and Kermit are male chauvinist. I don't know to say. Well, it's very common. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. 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 I, uh, I, I remember driving the tractor once, picking up hay down to when I was growing up, and I happened to the wagon went over the hired man's foot, and Grandpa says, Ah! Oh, he didn't tell me what I did, what to do different. So when I come up to Churchill's and we're haying, we always hay together between the two farms, Bob and Margaret and Ray and I. And I remember I had a load of hay on with the old David Brown in the lower pasture, and we're headed out. And Bob hollers, whoa! And I don't know if you remember Bob Churchill, but yeah. <laughs> wanted to see if you could stop before you got out on the main road. <laughs> but I was explained things and allowed to do stuff and you know um, and that's the way I brought my kids up when they were two weeks old or so they were out in the open seat in the um, barn and sat in front of the cows and watched their tongues lick their nose and different things. <laughs> teacher over to Mrs. Barris, over to the grade school, right in her same school she went to. Um, Brenda is an accountant and uh, works for, uh, what would you call it? Don't work for BTC anymore. She moved up. And Tina, the youngest one, is down in Boston. Oh, what a place to go visit. I don't do that very often. I just, I, if I do, I ride down on the bus and they pick me up at South Station and, and take me around. And, and Ray and I have been married for 46 years and, and uh, we better have and are having a very good life in the country. So where did you and Ray first meet? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Um. <laughs> okay, maybe we should go skip. <laughs> I haven't seen it lately. And uh, her, let's see, who stopped? Wes Snow and uh, Wendell Bushy and Ray. And Mother said, this is from her perspective when they were sitting there in the kitchen. Okay, so I was eyeballing Wendell. Wes was eyeballing me and Ray just sat in the corner. <laughs> You have to watch those quiet ones. Ray was the one that called up and asked me out. And so I did. So we went on a snow machine. <laughs> Next. All right, thank you guys. That was a quick introduction here. So we have, we have plenty of time left. And I, and I have questions in my mind, but I, I'm sure all of you from these quick introductions that we just did I have some questions also, so I would encourage people a good time now to ask. You want to just shout them out or raise your hand if you feel lucky? Yes, Ted. Yeah. Teresa, what school do you go to? Do you go to the one? In Parkfield, yes. Down here? Yeah, the new one over there. It's okay, size, was that? Was the other school up on the schoolhouse road there? No. That didn't My dad went there. And second question, did all of you that went to school in Brookfield, did you come here for your graduation? Yeah. Yep. Oh. No. We Let's turn the microphone on to those who can't answer an answer. No, because um, the town hall wasn't really functioning right then. So, um, and it was owned by a single person. And so we had our 
sixth grade graduation right here at Brookfield School, right in the gymnasium. We did our little dance and everything and our little speeches and our little marching in and marching back out, and that was about it. And then it was a little scary when we went to Randolph because we've never been in a big, in a big school like this before. And then having to transition from one class to the other, and you've got like three minutes to get from one class to the other, and it's like, how dang am I going to get from this end of the school to that end? <laughs> so, <laughs> in three minutes, <laughs> are they kidding? <laughs> so we, um, um, so that's where I went to school and graduated there, and I went through the vocational program, like a lot of kids that did back then, took, took technical classes, and but it didn't really amount to much because I ended back up on the farm. So. <laughs> I did graduate here on the stage of the old town hall. I had gone to the Brookfield Center School for four years. When I went to the first grade, it was one through eight. And the next year they divided and they had one through four stay at the Brookfield Center School. And from four to eight, from five to eight, the kids came to the Palm Village School. So we went to school in the house out by the palm, in the schoolhouse out by the palm. Which was very nice. The pond was there and it was a temptation. Uh, but our graduation was here, and that was the first time that we met some of the people who were from West Street, who had gone to the West Street School. It wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't you. And I think probably there were people from East Brookfield, too, that we had never met before, really, except for being in 4 -H. So it was kind of a close community. And it was not until I was an adult that I ever got over three four West Brookfield, which was very, it seemed like it was a foreign country over there, uh, because it was so far away. So uh, the town hall was used for graduation, but at that time it was also used for square dances. And square dances were really a lot of fun here. They would have benches along the wall, they had lovely bands, and they had a, a square dance caller. And one of my favorite partners in the square dancing was Wendell's brother, Carl. Oh. Who, and I also had this a great dancer friend, Viviette, from East Randolph. His father was a fiddle player here, so he would come, and he danced, and we danced, and didn't we have a good time? <laughs> So the question was about graduating here. Yes, I graduated here in, the, in eighth grade here in the town hall. Uh, this was used every Saturday night for round and square dancing. And oh, what a great time we had. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, that's the, the young people don't know what it's like to go out dancing and just have a good time. Now they can't do that anymore. Uh, I went to school at West Street and had to walk. I grew up on the dairy farm, which I didn't get to tell all this before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to speak now. Went to school, I had school clothes that I wore. And when I got home, I had to change my clothes and put on my work clothes. My school clothes were usually Wranglers. And I was not allowed to wear school jeans for school that had holes in them. But now they buy jeans with holes in them. Shame, shame, shame. And they cost too much. I mean, I wore mine out to get those holes. I had to uh, help feed the calves. I had to help hay, and where did I learn how to drive? In the hay field. Standard shift on a hill. I usually was very, very nervous, because 
when they said stop, they meant stop then. So you gotta push the clutch and push the brake. And then when you had to go, don't let it go backwards. Because they're all standing there. Because the hay will fall off if you're too fast for that. <laughs> and then we had, uh, when they had to use to pick up the hay, not before they bailed it, um, my father had this thing called the tooth that he had on the tractor that would go out and get under the hay, the piles of hay that was piled up, and lift it up and take it into the barn where they had to pitchfork it up over into the hay mills, which I helped do that too. So how many cows were on the farm? Do you remember? Uh, 40, 50 probably. But he he so had a big farm. Yeah, it was large. Yes, he did. And he bought a lot of land when the neighbors were ready to move off from farming, he'd buy the neighbor's land. He owned uh, ours, the one we grew up in, and the one next door. And then when Fred Blackley grew older and wanted to move to town, he bought his farm. And then there was another one about a mile down the road that went up for sale, and he bought that one. My mother was very mad at that. She <laughs> did not need to have more land until she went down there. That was on Holman Drive. And she saw the view from down there. Then she got over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is it, did you have similar experiences like Lori had and started going in the barn like it wasn't really like Oh, I, had, I had to go to the barn. Yes, yeah. yes. Yep. had to help feed the calves that didn't know how to drink out of a bucket. And you better watch out because you might get some alcohol over you. Know? <laughs> and, and, and then they invented the, the pail with a nipple on it. So that was a little easier. Uh, we had chickens, and we had to gather the eggs, and we had to weigh every one of those eggs and pack them into crates. And we had a truck come from Boston to pick them up. And the hens didn't like us going in to pick up our eggs. Oh yes, let's show them that this is what we had to weigh the eggs on. This is what I brought because when I was six or seven and my mother had chickens, same as Melanie. This was what my job was, is to put the egg here and something happened up there and somebody knew what this all meant, but I didn't. Well, I had to measure. It does have a small, medium, large. Yeah, probably. So, so was it, were some of the eggs rejected like you kept for yourselves and the rest went to market? Or? I don't. I, I think this, this has numbers on it that goes from 18 to 30. Hmm. So whatever that meant, you probably would have known. Small but it was quite exciting to be six and do it. Well, we had to clean the eggs, too. Yeah. They weren't, they didn't come. <laughs>
as big as we got. We pretty small. And as soon as Betty left, my father sold the cows. So <laughs> no more labor. So that and that was uh, we farmed through the 1968. 1968. But in 1950, he went to Tunbridge Fair and he bought his first tractor. And he came home and immediately sold the cow, the horses. And he also bought a milk cooler. And he said that he never went back to the fair again until that it was 12 or so and wanted to get a dog. Because he said it was way too expensive to go. <laughs> we, did, we did get as far as having a milk cooler, what they call the bolt tanks. But that was towards the end of the farming. So you went from upstairs to downstairs at that time? And as far as milking goes, or were you all yes. upstairs? Yes, no, we're all, we were all upstairs. We had a second floor stable. So even with the milk cooler, you were still upstairs? Yeah, the cooler is downstairs, so you carry the milk down. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And one of the reasons I think he stopped farming when he did was because the dairy board, whoever it was, decreed you had to have cement floors. Right, right. And, and we had wooden floors in a raised barn. Yeah. There was no yeah. way to do a cement floor right. practically. So he said, and goodbye house. <laughs> so we have 15 minutes left here, and I know uh, we you know, have dominated some things here, but I want to give people up some of this. Do you I'll, just, I'll just throw it out to all of you. Did you have sledding parties? Did you oh, all yes. talk about ice cream? Did Time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> they still on? Yes. Yeah. Um, we had one neighbor that had this Travis. You know what Travis is? And it was big. We could all get on. And he had a steering wheel. Cool. We all get on, get your feet on the runners, and the one in the back could push it. And we had the hill up above our farm, go down that hill, and down another one. Two hills. Three hills. <laughs> Three hills to go down and then up, which is the interstate went through so that hill isn't there anymore. It was such fun. And how did you get back up? Pulling the Travis, everybody pulled. Oh. <laughs> long walk. Long walk. Yeah. They used to um, close off uh, Bannister Hill. East Hill, mm -hmm. for part of the way down, a couple of times in the winter. And then we had a sliding party there with the church group. And so we could slide up, we walked up and just slide down and around. And it was before they put that last curb in, so you came across, straight across the bridge there. And there, but we had those sliding parties <laughs> frequently in our way. Yeah, those, that was a really good ride. <laughs> yeah. Did you have sleigh rides or uh, no sleighs? We had, um, I had eight brothers and sisters, and we had an eight-seater Travis, and right outside our driveway was a long hill that was a great uh, sliding, plus it wasn't a hill, it was a road, a traveled road, and so one of the kids, somebody would stay down at the bottom of the hill and tell us when the road was clear. Well, my, I had five brothers, and they put me in the front of the Travis. <laughs> Needless to say, and I was, you know, I was just glad to be included. So of course I sat there and steered it until you get down at the bottom, the corner, and I couldn't make the corner, and so down across we go into the tucker brush in the woods, and I came out with a lot of scratching and lost oh. many hats, but they, they were good fun. And I couldn't say no. We also had a pond that froze over that we went skating on. Um, and another thing we had, I was I'm French Canadian. My uh, father had many brothers and sisters, and they all lived in Barrie. And there were three of them in Barrie, and each family had seven and eight kids. Well, it was a tradition for Sunday night, they would all come to our farm with their musical instruments, a fiddle and accordion and guitar. And um, among those, among us, there were 24 cousins, all the same ages. And 
we have a kitchen junket. We, us kids would go out and play hide and seek until it got dark, and then the music would start, and we'd all go in the house and sit around and listen to music and dance. Those are great, great memories. Too bad they don't still do them. We were talking about sliding. Uh, I got some fond memories of my father sliding with us. Anytime he ever went sliding with us, something always happened. So one day he took the runner sled, and you know, we've been sliding pretty good on the crust. Well, when father got on it, the runners went through, and he kept going, and he was just gone. Oh. <laughs> and then uh, another, uh, this. This is really not nice, but it's a it's a fun memory of my mother. <laughs> you know, we used to have the saucers, and you'd sit on them cross cross legged, and you'd go flying down through. And again, mother went over, but she didn't lose. She hung right onto the saucer, and her head went in, and here she was, you know, in the saucer, and she upside down. And <laughs> I can still picture her. Um, <laughs> We had a, a farm pond, well it's still there now, and Grandpa, we were kind of spoiled, um, Grandpa used to shovel that off for us <laughs> to go skating, and then it had a little hill too if you wanted to get your saucer or your sled and go flying across the pond. Um, somebody mentioned 4-H over here, and we had a lot of sliding parties with 4-H. Uh, I can remember going to Ilsley's down here. Well, it's where Jeremy is now. Um, we get way up in the corner and down we go and then had to walk back up. But it was so much fun going down that she did walk back up. And then when we got, our kids used to slide down on my neighbor's driveway, um, Chris and George Blacks, and they had a lot of fun on that. And they got to go on pretty fast going down through there sometimes. But, uh, and, uh, Oh, there's a, were you by the home 4-H or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was East Brookfield 4-H. Yeah, that Mr. Hill started, right? I don't know. I know Steve Allen's yeah. mother taught us so much. Yeah, well. you guys are in 4-H. Mrs. Cage taught us knitting. And Florence Montgomery taught us cooking. Yeah, 4-H is another um, member, fond memory I had. It was Little Brook 4-H Club of Pat and we always met over in Drysdale's Red Barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I joined when I was, oh, I don't know, nine or 10. I was still in, I'm on the foundation of, in Orange County. Ice cream booth is coming up at Tunbridge Fair. I'll be there. And I teach the, still teach the kids sewing. Um, there was another thing that just flashed in my mind now. Go. Here, we'll, let's, open, let's open it up. Is there some other questions out there? Yes? Just for information, the Enterprise 4-H Club from East Brookfield was the, one of the longest running, continuously running clubs in the state. Yes, it was. Yep. That's the one I was saying. So was there, was there just a, an East Brookfield one, and then there was like a West Brookfield one? Was there several, obviously, probably in the state? Or in the town? Uh, yes, there must have been because they're all the East Brookfield kids in when I was there. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Yeah. Wakefield, Mrs. Wakefield did it over in West Brookfield, I think. We had one on West Street. Yeah. Because I know my mother taught. Yeah, Margaret used to keep teach so um, cooking yeah. in that one. My mother taught so much. I, I thought of the other thing that was yeah. very important in my life. <laughs> when I was 11 years old, Lester Welch needed some hay. And he was short of money, but he had a really nice little colt named Duke. And so father had some hay and a little bit of money, and, and I got my first horn. Oh. Uh, and Duke was, he was the most perfect horse. I know everybody says that, but Duke was. <laughs> and we had so much fun on him. And we had three generations that rode and showed him. I got my grandfather on him one time, took him to the old pokey show in the lead line class. <laughs> and you think that these old people, well, I guess I'm getting up there, but anyways, <laughs> Grandpa and the class 
Floyd Fuller was also in that lead line class. And Grandpa got the blue ribbon, and he was so tickled that he had beat Floyd Fuller. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know what the rivalry might have been there, but that horse Floyd was quite a horse jockey, and uh, that could have been it. And, and my horse was always someplace I could go, you know, from Magic Folks or Magic World. And Duke and I would go for a ride, and everything would be all there. <laughs> so, any, yes, Dennis. Warwick, can you tell them what Floyd Fuller was really famous for? What? What Floyd was really famous for doing. Oh, Floyd and TNT, yes. What? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, oh, he could judge an animal. I had this really nice horse. He wasn't quite as perfect as Duke, but he was good. <laughs> but he pulled back, meaning he pulled back and sit there until something broke. So Floyd came over to uh, Float Spooner's Chief one day. He hadn't been there five minutes. And he says to Spooner, you weren't brought up quite right, were you? And I said, how did you know that? You know, he just knew all these things. And, um, and he was oh, so good with the horses. Lots of times people now have had them drugged and everything. But Floyd would just talk to him and whoever. And, uh, Get it all done and be all over. And we have, uh, yes, a couple over here. Go ahead. get on the interstate to go to BTC. And it cut off all the time. Of course, it wasn't supposed to be up there. We drove some snow machines on it. And there wasn't an exit there. No, there wasn't. <laughs> Gigi had an exit. <laughs> <laughs> Until he got caught. <laughs> but, you know, well, that was good and bad. Um, they took a lot of the sugar maple at uh, yeah. Churchill Farm. I was just a little kid, but I remember the interstate coming through. My grandfather caught it, moose and tail, um, right at the at the state house, but he lost. They took uh, 42 acres out of our land um, and over 1,500 sugar maples. And my grandfather liked to sugar, so it kind of broke his heart. Um, I remember just just as a little kid, you know, they do the blasting at night. And we were just about ready to sit down for supper and they knock on our door and tell us we had to leave. We had to leave our supper. We had to get in the car and we had to drive down the road so they could blast. When we came back, we had 11 broken windows in the house. They had to replace that. Um, this went on for several weeks. Every other night or so, we'd have to get out and leave the house drive down the road so they could blast. We could, we could find all kinds of sharp rocks in our, in our pastures and fields from the blasting. Um, it it was, was pretty heart, heartbreaking when you hear that blasting going on. And it took our water from the house and it took our water from our pastures when they blasted. It interrupted our water supplies. We had um, springs for the house, and we had springs for the cows. So we had no water. So the state ended up bringing in water for our cows for over a year, because we didn't have water. And then they drilled us a, a well for the house, fixed our windows, and we still didn't have water for the pasture. We had, we, Pasture down on the other side here on Stone Road. And there was a spring there, and that was interrupted, so there was no water there. So they had to haul water for the cows there for all summer long. They got sick of doing that, so they drilled us a well. 
Um, so we got well out of it. But as I remember with the kids, that night, and we were done chores, we'd sneak up onto the interstate and see what was there. We'd walk up and down as far as our land was, see what they were doing. Sometimes they'd leave something there. And then we, as kids, you know, we just, we didn't know. We just picked it up and brought it home. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad said, where'd you get that? And so I said, well, they left it there. Well, he said, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> as kids, we just thought it was fun. But, you know, and then the interstate came through and cars started going 90 miles an hour through there. and. Sometimes we had to get our cows on the other side of the interstate, so as kids we thought we'd just jump the fence and run a shortcut across the interstate. <laughs> well, of course there wasn't as many cars then as there is now, but um, Dad knew what we were doing. He figured it out. <laughs> here, let's, let's pass along. We have uh, less than five minutes here, so we'll try to be wrapped up by 8.30. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the interstate has some positives, too, because uh, when I was a kid, uh, my brother had to go up to Burlington for speech therapy, and it was a very long day. It would take three or four hours to get to Burlington, and then it would take three or four hours to get back to Burlington. And now when you think about it, you can zoom out here to Northfield to exit five, be in Burlington in 45 minutes. So it has certainly made that commute a little easier. However, I don't know if it's so nice to be so close to Burlington <laughs> or so close to Boston or so close to Lebanon. The only advantage is we have many hospitals, very good hospitals, very close to us now. Okay. How many of you are still farming? Well, I'm So there's th three are still involved with farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, involved. Is that, is there? Well, we still milk in a couple of cows. Yeah. I still live on the old farm. Like, I like, never moved. Only one big house for a small house. Mm -hmm. At one point, they were talking about putting the um, entrance and exits right here in Brookfield. Yes, they did. So, no, we were talking about putting that there. So, Mary, do you have some? Do you have something about the interstate? Yeah, I was going to say, without the interstate, you all wouldn't be here. So we're grateful to it. We're glad because we have we have a vital, vital community. And we, we would not. Keith wouldn't be sending his milk right. without the interstate. I, and it's it's just been as far as the entire community is concerned, I think a valuable yeah. and it resource. Brought, brought the out of staters into the state. Yep. For, for the it brought the out of staters yeah. in, it brought the hippies in. Thank God. John, there was another question. Did you did you have a question that you were uh, Brookfield 1972? Um, there was the, the main road from, from Grand Old Center to Brookfield was dirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to drive my horse and slave it up to the up the, the store. Buy it and wouldn't have some hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. And then in the next couple of years it started to get paid. So, um, and, and the hails, you know, because they lived right on the road. How muddy it was. It was incredible muddy. It was crazy muddy in the spring. By Chetso, by Abbott's there. And sometimes you couldn't get through because the drifts were so hot. So is there any if us we have we can squeeze in some more questions if there are some more yes? I'm just curious about how the clothes have changed. skirts to school. And so we used to have cotton stockings. The what about you did shorts in there? When we, when we came home, we changed out of our school clothes, and then we could put on, on slacks. 
we did not, our family didn't wear jeans until we were pretty old. And because uh, my, my father didn't think they were appropriate. And so we wore pants, but they weren't, they weren't jeans um, when we were home. But for school, all the way, in fact, all the way through UVM, I had to wear a skirt. And that was just, that was the, the times. I think I wore skirts in high school, but by the time I got to UVM, 68 it happened. Yeah. And, and so it was, yeah. all the girls were gone. Yeah. Um, but we always it had school clothes and, and others. So you took off your school clothes when you got home and yeah. put on your arm clothes and off you went. You may. This place, I've come to Floating Bridge since I was seven years old. My mom would bring us, Sue is my cousin, and we'd all come up and hang out on Floating Bridge and sit on the edge of the drive and let our butts get wet when the cars went over. It was very <laughs> thrilling. And we just love this place. It was magical, and it has been magical my whole life. And so I want to thank you all for telling us about your childhoods, because I, I love this place. It's a beautiful spot. So thank you. Well, it, it keeps recycling coming around, you know? Like, uh, they're talking about the short uh, shorts you see down in school right now. Well, when, remember the hot pants? Yeah. I remember wearing hot pants. One night I had got ready to go for a date, and my parents were at home. Oh, this is a neat thing. We lived in a big house. One side was us, and the other side was my grandparents. So my parents were gone when I got dressed, and I was going out with Ray to the drive-in movie with my hot pants on. <laughs> <laughs> I went in and went in to say goodnight to Grandpa and Grammy, and, and Grammy was just <laughs> taken back. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't go out with a bit of rain with those on, and Grandpa sits there with a grin. Why can't she? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, let's get a big congratulations for these guys, and thank you. <laughs>